Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running and nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, I hope you're having a fantastic day because, well, we have a great show planned for you where in the second part of the program, we will be doing computer and technology news. And that is going to have everything from, oh, I don't know, uh, oddly enough, the coronavirus and what that has to do with the uh, the impact that could possibly happen to Apple and their latest iPhone 9, which is like their kind of, uh, you know, not since like the iPhone 5e have they had kind of a a less expensive phone let's put it that way so it could impact the production of that we're going to talk about cadillac and their enhanced super cruise and stuff like that so it's going to be a large variety a lot of different topics and hey you know we cover the news so that you don't have to dig, dig through it all to find the um, you know the the very interesting stories things that you should hear about that you probably don't hear about elsewhere so stay tuned on computer america for that but in the first part of the program as usual we have well we have a dedicated to a guest and uh not so usual i believe that i believe this is the first time that a company called facetto f-a-s-e-t-t-o if you'd like to check them out facetto.com and uh yeah this will be the first time that we're going to have them on the program and we're going to be talking about their latest product uh their latest product called forum and yeah it's um this is going to be the best place if you haven't heard of them or the product then hey we're going to talk all about how they do it what they do that kind of thing so in just a moment but first computeramerica.com that will have a link to our guest website that will have a link to any articles, videos, reviews, topics, anything and everything at ComputerAmerica.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out some of our recent articles and reviews. We put our own stuff up as well. And on top of that, find us on social media. And uh, hey, you know, if you missed the live portion, also be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Tag us with you. Now, hey, that was a lot. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get to really, you know, the whole point of this program and that is to introduce you once again to facetto so joining us is none other than mr dan brook he is the chief marketing officer for facetto and let's go ahead and there we go we should be able to hear him dan welcome on to computer america how you doing i'm doing great thanks for having me ben our pleasure our pleasure and yeah this is um so we're going to be talking all about i guess this is about meeting productivity and you know this is a very uh, important topic because we have seen a flood of kind of productivity socializing uh, uh you know these kinds of apps but yeah, different organizations either they jump from one to the next trying to find a perfect fit but they can't or they're you know, it's very hard to find one that seems to have everything that the group needs and it integrates you know very very seamlessly so uh before we get started on the product and what it is and how it works let's get a bit of background on facetto and a bit of background on yourself how did you find yourself working with this have you have you always been in tech well um first off Facetto is this amazing company that 
I think was born originally of frustration. In other words, we have a lot of devices in our lives, but sometimes they don't talk well with each other and sharing and communicating is a challenge. And I think that that's really at the root of what this company is trying to do. It's trying to ease communication and the use of devices between people just to make it easier and more simple. Removing barriers, uh, removing friction between communication devices. So my background, and I'll, I'll actually jump into why I was attracted to the company. Sure. I found out about this product called Forum, and I thought, first, why didn't someone think of this sooner? And what a cool application that fits this middle need between, sure, we've got video conferencing solutions. We like those. And we all have you know email and such. But if you need to share visual information in an office, this is a cool, elegant way to share visuals between people that are in the same place in space. And I guess up until this point, uh, you know, just just talk, just if you would talk real quick and address the pain points that you know people were having. Uh, was it a matter of you know devices just not having the same operating system so it wouldn't work? Was it uh, soft, you know, firm or I should say uh, software versions that weren't compatible? I mean, what were the pain points that really led uh, you know form to be created? Well, our uh, our CEO and founder, quite Christmas. Um, in his professional life, found himself presenting to a lot of different groups in a lot of different places in a lot of different scenarios. And imagine this, you're the guest into a company, you walk in, and they've given you 30 minutes to do a pitch, make a presentation, sell them something, whatever. And you have a presentation to show because you know how impactful that can be. Yet, you don't have the right cable. You don't have the right connector. You, the dongle is not working or is in some other conference room or the projector and the monitor just aren't working. All of a sudden, that 30 minute opportunity has turned into 10 to 15 minutes of stress trying to find a way to connect so you can share this visual information. And then you've lost a bunch of time. You've lost your momentum. You've lost your audience more than anything else. And so he was looking for a way of being able to go into a situation, whether it was in a conference room, a meeting room, an open office, maybe it was a lunch meeting or a meeting at Starbucks, and be able to open up a laptop and communicate with everybody's devices that they already have in their hands, be it a phone, a tablet, or a laptop. And so that's how the idea of Forum was born. And so the basic idea of the product is, is we repurpose the Wi-Fi chip that's in any common laptop. Mm -hmm. And then the devices on their, the web enabled devices that people have point to that laptop and they see exactly what's on the presenter screen. Presentations can take two forms in, in my view of things. For example, quarterly, I do a, a major presentation to the executives in a typical work environment. That's a, a very, rehearsed and planned PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And I might have opportunities for Q&A in that or something like that. But then there's other opportunities where you just want people to connect so they can see what you see. And that might be, hey, let's watch this video team. Hey, let's take a look at the spreadsheet. Hey, we've got a couple pages of PowerPoint to look at. And so you can do this immediate screen sharing between devices, no cables, no internet, Nothing needed other than that laptop with our software. Very, and and of course that uh, that seamlessness is going to um, you know be very attractive to, like you said, uh, uh, you know a lot of different audiences because hey, you know you can't exactly go into a company that you don't work for and say everyone here has to download this program so that my presentation will work. They're just going to look at you like you're you know crazy. But uh, here's what I usually ask of you know companies that come on the show, and I will say that with forum and you know with this product what technology innovation really led to um you know to this product because so in so many cases uh i, I would kind of assume for something like uh you know something like forum 
it would really be uh, you know these higher powered uh, Wi-Fi chips in all these different computers and you know that kind of thing and then on top of that I would assume the uh, really the bandwidth that everyone can kind of utilize and access I mean what what would you say is something that really led to you know the product form you know kind of taking shape was it just technology getting better in in general and hey you can now this is this is now the better alternative to what we had in the past I would say that because Forum is built upon Facetto's proprietary gravity platform, there are all kinds of capabilities that are just not common out there. Uh, Facetto has dozens of patents mm -hmm. around this technology, uh, again, facilitating communication between devices in this really elegant way much more powerful than what we're accustomed to. And so it is that, that gravity platform that becomes the, I'll call it the power source and the inspiration behind Forum. It gives us the capabilities. And then we look at, okay, we've got this kind of capability. What are some of the potential uses of this? And I, I think it was probably day two of me being at Facetto. Mm -hmm. I started thinking about, wow, if you've got this core technology, what can you do with it? So the basic idea, laptop and devices can connect. So it's obvious that if people in an open office, for example, want to share visual information, that if they can't get in a conference room, they don't have conference rooms, um, they don't want to waste time looking for a conference room, and they just want to meet in someone's private office or down in the company cafeteria, they can do it now. I mean, all those barriers are off of having to wait for a conference room. A couple of considerations in a typical company environment, a conference room on average costs $45,000 to build. Wow. That doesn't include the square footage that is dedicated to that space. Uh, it doesn't include the furnishings and all the other things and the maintenance for that. So conference rooms are, pri are pretty expensive. So now... Uh, there's been a, a move to a lot of what they call huddle spaces. Um, all the estimates we see that there are between 35 and 50 million huddle spaces in company sites worldwide. Well, that's great. We can talk, but so often we need to share visual information and now we can, and you don't need tables necessarily. And you don't need infrastructure and large monitors. You just need the people and a couple of simple devices that, everybody already has. So the everybody already has part of it is important because what does that do? It virtually eliminates any capital expenditure cost mm -hmm. to operate for them. So, and, and this may be jumping around just a little bit, but I wanted, um, you know, a little clarification on something. Uh, so this works with any device. I assume that uh, most corporations out there, uh, last time we looked at the, at the statistics, it was well over, you know, we just had a gentleman on the show saying that, uh, you know, they saw in their studies, it was like 70% of corporations uh, have embraced the bring your own device model. And, you know, 30% are still, you know, company issued. And it looks like it's actually going the way of, you know, bring your own phone that you would have normally and we'll work it into our system. My, and, and uh, I'm not sure if you have any insight on that, but uh, just, uh, just hold it right there. I will say that um, when you bring your own device, it's not just a company device. It's a personal device as well. And I'm sure that you've addressed this and I'm hoping to, um, you know, kind of get a little clarification on when you share information with forum, um, how, how are you sure, you know, what you're sharing is what you want to share? So it's not uh, random pictures on your phone. It's not random incoming text messages and things like that. You're only sharing what you want others to see when it's on your phone or sure. other device. First, it's worth saying that whether it's bring your own device or the company's device, we're agnostic. We don't care. It's a device and mm -hmm. it's web enabled. So we're good to go there. Um, the source device, the presenting device must be a laptop. So you don't have to worry so much about strange photos on your phone mm -hmm. because that's not the presentation source. It would be the laptop. And, um, and again, you can, you can present a fully produced PowerPoint that you load into forum, or you can randomly pick icons and videos and such off of your desktop and play those and share those on a screen share. So, 
it's it's no different than someone looking over your shoulder and saying something that's on your laptop. It's you know if you screen share, you screen share. I got it. No, and and thank you for saying that. So it has to be a laptop, and I'm and, and of course, so that means uh, let's say emails, for instance, uh, you could definitely hide those or you know just. Uh, uh, you know, do a fully, fully prepared PowerPoint, and then uh, your desktop wouldn't even come into the scenario. It would just be the PowerPoint. So, all right, no, that makes uh, that makes sense. And then, of course, like you said, from a laptop to any tablet, phone, other computer, uh, really, it it doesn't matter. As and uh, I think we actually went to CES and we saw you guys out there. You had a great booth set up. Uh, with lots of examples, and I remember you had like you know little thirty minutes um, uh, kind of demonstrations that you were running around the clock, and I remember kind of walking by, and you know we were checking it out. Um, so when you were putting these uh, you know these presentations together, they it was very cool to just be able to walk by and just see the pres- you know the, the presentation on your phone on your tablet. Talk about what the viewer gets to keep like uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you are able to save files like if you need to share a spreadsheet or something like that people can download through through the app sure. like is it strictly viewing or is it also file sharing no and, and here's the beauty of forum it makes meetings more interactive by that meaning the presenter could quickly throw a poll to the audience. Now, if you've got three people in your office and you're presenting to them, that's probably not the most important feature. But imagine now you're the CEO of a company and you're doing a a, a quick uh, overview of how the company's doing and you want to get the pulse of your employees. And there's now maybe 150 people in the warehouse for an impromptu presentation by the CEO. The CEO can throw poll questions to all of the employees. They can respond anonymously through the forum software. So it becomes a much more interactive thing. Now let's even elevate it more. Let's do a a keynote with 600 people in the room. Well, how much of a voice in a keynote situation does the typical audience have? Not much. Uh, I like to joke that they're in listen only mode, like when we jump on conference calls, they really have no voice. And yes, there might be a microphone, but what are the odds that 600 people are going to be able to ask the questions they want to ask? That would be no chance at all. So now with forum software, their devices, I mean, yes, there's iMag, there's image magnification in the typical keynote, uh, but maybe you're in the back of the row and you can't see it as clearly or more on the sides. And so, yes, you're able to see things right on your device that are being presented, but you can answer the polls that are thrown out by the presenter and you can pose questions. The presenter does not get interrupted. A little queue comes up in their operational screen that says, hey, there's some questions in the queue and they can choose to look at them or not. Uh, so, so it makes meetings much more powerful. Uh, the audience at any time can download the presentation if the presenter wants them to or allows them to. Mm -hmm. And all of this, by the way, is Mm -hmm. totally secure. So there's a password to sign into, um, you know, the Wi-Fi you use could be a secure network. So there's a lot of things that control, you know, who gets visibility to the presentation. And, um, And it's probably also worth mentioning, you can have an audience of up to 10 just off of your laptop Wi-Fi. If you want to have a larger audience, let's say up to 32, we have a a travel router that you can purchase. That combined with forum allows you to speak to that magic number of 32. And why is that important? Well, that's about the typical size of a large class in a high school or college. Mm. So now think of another scenario. Uh, Instead of the students struggling to see what are actually smaller and smaller screens in classrooms now. Uh, they've gone on to the smart board versus projector model in many, uh, many schools. Yeah. They're smaller, harder to read, more detail. Now, again, the students can see exactly what's on screen right in front of them on their device, download the lesson plan, the lecture materials, everything right there. So uh, we've done a bunch of research and, and found academic research that was done in the educational area about seating position and the effect that it has in a classroom scenario. So what they found is students who sit in the middle front Mm -hmm. are participating more 
and getting better grades. The students that are more in the back and the sides of the classroom, less so. So now all of a sudden we're democratizing education as well. I got to say, as someone who sat in the uh, in the back middle, I will say that uh, I was a horrible student. So I'm going to blame my seat from now on and not actually my uh, my enthusiasm. But I will say that seeing, uh, you know, seeing what you can do with these presentations, I can completely understand where, uh, you know, your your team has said, let's try this in the classroom. And some of the features, you know, like we mentioned with uh, the file downloads and the contact exchange, that kind of thing is just so crucial to uh, class in, uh, classrooms because then you're not worrying about, I guess, taking notes or having to get like a printed version or something like that. Uh, you could just have the file on hand and you can really focus in sure. on what the presenter is presenting. So. And there's two components in addition. One is the green component. You're not creating a bunch of lesson plans that you have to hand out to students. So that saves on paper. But then on the teacher's perspective, uh, I would say that they have an added advantage now of because of this polling process, if let's say they're teaching a calculus class and they're not really sure if the students understand and they don't know if they should move forward or spend more time, they can send out a quick assessment question to the class and very, very quickly understand whether the students understand the lesson at all. So it's that kind of educational tool that has a value. I've, now it I've, gets even more fun. Look, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm saying that uh, I've been in the situation where calculus was one of my worst, um, you know, classes in college. And really, you get to the point where the you know where the teacher or the professor is uh, standing there going, "Does anyone not understand this? Should we move on?" And you feel this this social pressure to not stand out, not you know, not make a fuss, not hinder other people's education. So even though I wouldn't understand it. I definitely wouldn't say anything because, you know, raising your hand would single you out and, you know, possibly, you know, draw attention to yourself. But, you know, be, being able to do that anonymously and still get, a, you know, the result that you want, that sounds much more preferable. And, and let's get out of the classroom in the school environment. Now let's go to the greater campus. So what are most high school and college uh, colleges have? They have football teams and sports teams, right? Imagine you're the coach of the football team and the whole high school team is going to jump on a school bus and drive an hour across town to the crosstown rivals for the big game. What would the coach like to do? Well, the coach would like to review plays on that bus ride. How can they do that? It's impossible. Well, with forum, all they do is open up a laptop. Every player student opens up their phone and they can all see plays as they go to the game. So instead of a wasted hour, you have a pro productive hour. They play the game. Now they're coming back. What does the coach want to do? He wants to review game footage. And again, this is where the screen sharing live video feeds can be pushed out to every phone on the bus or laptop. Yeah. Or tablet. No, it's uh, some something that's very, very different. And uh, and honestly, I'm trying to think of some of your competitors out there. Uh, where in my head, I'm thinking things like Skype or Zoom, if they're even in the same field. Um, how you would do this, uh, you know, with with either of these different products. And I, you know, like I, uh, I think Skype just recently allowed like four, I think up to four people to uh you know to, to video call each other you can share a screen on skype and, and uh zoom and things like that but they aren't really suited for um you know large groups and i think both have you uh, of course you know download onto your uh phone or download onto your system how do you compare to other products on the market that are trying to fill this smart meeting uh, software Sure. Well, at, at the top, Skype, Zoom, the others, they all require the internet. We do not. Mm. We create our own Wi-Fi. So you don't even need Wi-Fi present because we create our own. So that's a big difference. But we're big fans of those products. And we at Facetto use Zoom and we also use Teams. Um, Form is truly a different product for a different purpose, which is people in the same room at the same time. And I think that the sweet spot for the other companies is really a different use case scenario. 
That makes sense. So, uh, so obviously, people who are not even you know anywhere near each other, uh, they would definitely benefit from this. But I think even uh, more to that point, and you know, let's say someone is uh, maybe working from home, and you have people who want to, you know, kind of teleconference into a room. Do you have the capability, or is it strictly room to room? That is forms bread and butter, and you're sticking to it. No, it's our bread and butter is people in the same room and that is what we're sticking to um, we appreciate that there's other products out there and other solutions out there for different scenarios that's not what we're trying to do uh, our, right. our expertise and, and how we're leveraging our ip our intellectual property is is really through forum people in the same room meetings Make, makes perfect sense and, and, and definitely I, I can I can appreciate a company that knows what they do best and really sticks to it and you already mentioned things like um, you know of course conference uh, conference rooms but then if you want to take it out into these huddle spaces uh, you mentioned things like buses and you know sports teams schools education uh, just real quick off the top of your head are there any uh, you know have, have you seen people using forum to their benefit in any other situations where you're like, where you and your team are like, wow, we didn't even consider that. Maybe for uh, you know on-the-job training purposes or anything. Does anything leap to your mind? Yeah, corporate training is a natural because it's just another form of a classroom, and you get all those same advantages. And most corporations are doing some form of training, uh, either because it's mandatory or because they're progressive or because they need to. Uh, because it's the right thing to do to learn new products and, and understand new things. So now your your classroom is full of uh, people that are engaged and and the teaching process is much more interactive. So certainly corporate training, but um, we just heard of one the other day that was kind of interesting, mm -hmm. uh, which we haven't explored yet, but police roll calls. So imagine you're a field officer you're in a roll call. We've all seen the TV dramas, right? They sit there and the watch commander, watch sergeant says, hey, be on the lookout for, for this person or be on the lookout for that car. Now imagine that same content dumped onto every person's device who's in that roll call and then all the officers take off out into the field. Now they have it on their phone or their tablet or their laptop. So that one just popped up. It's funny, it's a yellow post-it note on my, on my monitor. It's one of the ones I'm gonna work on. But there's others and we've got, for example, a museum that wanted to have a more interactive experience for museum visitors. So in a typical historical site, museum, there's a lot more to see that you can't see because maybe things are off exhibit, maybe there are historical components, old photographs that they just can't show people. Uh, a docent would have to carry books and books of images, video clips, et cetera. But now a docent can lead a group around a museum, historical site, in many cases, historical sites where there's maybe not much left. It's in ruins. Uh, they can share images, timelines, artist renditions of what it was like back in its glory days. Yeah. Uh, and of course, for anyone out there watching the video portion of the show, uh, I definitely found it uh, facet.com form, uh, form for museums. And yeah, you know, you can see it right there. And, you know, of course, there's there's the Triceratops skeleton. But then, of course, you can give a, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of background information just by pointing at it. And really, I think uh, what both of those, you know, between the the police officers and the museum and things like that, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it just seems like uh, Facetto and really Forum is really uh, latching onto this idea that people want to be able to really just kind of dump uh, files and and you know dump a chunk of information quickly, easily, without you know without hassle, and you know just have it at people's fingertips, whether that's for education, whether that's for productivity purposes. It just seems like your um, the forum product is filling a niche of just instant file transfers. And I know that there are many services out there that will do file transfers, but to be able to do that, you know, kind of on the fly, uh, platform agnostic, that is still something that needs refined. And I think, you know, you are kind of finding that in a lot of different use cases. It seems like we are, and and I think of a typical, you know, historical museum site experience, just like so many of other use cases for us. 
you know, wouldn't it be nice to extend that experience and the, and the joy of seeing something, you know, beautiful art, um, historical objects in, in a museum, uh, historical sites, and being able to have that with you and review it and then share it with your friends and family. Because imagine if you're an adult, you take a vacation, you come back, well, you could take photographs, but imagine getting that download from the museum, the historical people that are there on site, and then being able to share it with your children and friends. I think that makes the experience stickier and more powerful. Uh, and, and definitely for sure. Uh, you know, one of uh, a very interesting guest that we had not too long ago about museums was a company that is working with museums for augmented reality. And they want to have uh, their patrons, you know, kind of wear AR glasses, walk through the exhibits, and they would actually see, you know, either it'd be like outdoor grounds and they'd recreate things. But essentially, they were showing videos and movies overlaid on real life uh, objects. And I think something like Forum would be great if you could not only use the AR glasses and see them in person, but then be able to take those images and those movies that they overlay, uh, you know, kind of with you. And that that really shows that uh, you've built something that is flexible. It's not it's not just for uh, you know the corporate um, conference room, but I think that you're going to be seeing a lot of different use cases like that. So very very interesting. Let's. Um, if you wouldn't mind, just real quick, let's touch on, well, the pricing, because you said it doesn't matter how many people, uh, you said that, uh, you know, it was up to a couple for just a, any typical laptop. You could buy the router and you could do up to 32. Uh, how's your pricing scheme? Do, you know, does everyone need a license? Talk about how people, you know, actually buy into this. Sure. Uh, if you're just a single presenter and you want to present to up to 10 people, all you need is Forum Soho. And that's $9.95 a month, and you can download that from our website. Uh, let's say you had a larger work group. You had maybe 20, 30 people reporting to you, and you met with them regularly, or you're a teacher. Uh, Forum Plus, and that's $39.95 a month, and you would need either to use an existing Wi-Fi network or a router that would be additional. I got if you. you're a larger organization, mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the like one of the perfect use cases of forum, and this one came up very recently, is a construction company. They're making bridges and roads um, out and away from the cities in many cases. There's no infrastructure whatsoever, but they need to share a lot of visual information. So uh, construction companies is one of our other use cases. And so anytime it's an enterprise type um, sale, we'll just do custom pricing for it. But we don't charge on the audience size and the audience seats because there's nothing for them to use. It's just the devices they have. There's no software. It's only the presenter seat. I got no, and that makes perfect sense. And, uh, and I'm sure that you didn't know this, but um, actually, Autodesk is a longtime friend of the show, and we are pretty good friends with their construction side, and you know we have a few contacts there. And yeah, you're right. I, I mean, they have to send information and, and like one of the use cases that Autodesk is running into more and more is that they have a drone pilot who will go up and inspect bridges and damage and construction you know instead of sending someone up there uh, either climbing or what have you they'll just send a drone with a camera and I would think that you know if it were if it were possible to screen share and show everyone on the construction site what the drone would be seeing when they inspect a bridge something like that uh, seems completely possible Possible with your product, it does. And but who wants to be in that awkward scenario of you know eight people at a construction site huddled around someone's one laptop? Tablet. Yeah, no one really wants to go there, right? So this is an opportunity for everybody to see what the drone is seeing, whether it's five people or fifty people. Right, and and of course that's uh, that would be very very uh, useful. So actually, and and I mentioned this very uh, quickly before, but uh, we were able to see your product out at CES. You know, you guys were, uh, I believe, you were at Pepcom and Showstoppers as well, as well as having uh, a very large booth on the show floor in the central hall. I want to say. And yeah, it, yes. if, um, yeah. So CES was, of course, a mass of humanity. I think last I heard, it was about 180 thousand people came through. Uh, it's and you know thousands of companies. It's hard to, you know, not really. Just, it's not hard to stand out. I mean, you put up your signs and you're good to go. But it's it's hard to really 
I guess, get everyone to see your product because there's just so much to see, so much to cover. How was CES? Obviously, you guys are software focused. Um, you know, you didn't have, let's say, a fancy, you know, you, you didn't have a car or a new camera or a TV to show off. How was CES for a software company? You would never know that it was a gadget show when you looked at the traffic in our booth. Uh, we had three different presentation areas. Um, rotating our presentations between them. And we had a very captive audience with all of them. And we even saw patterns where, you know, we have two sides of our business. Certainly forum is available for consumer or enterprise purchase right now, but we're also a technology incubator and in that we're creating some technology that we will license out to larger companies. And what was kind of fun is to see some pretty high level decision makers at some of the world's largest technology companies in our booth. The next day, two or three more from that same company. And then by the third day, perhaps the chief technology officer of that very large multinational technology company was in our booth. And so you, you see what was happening in the dynamic. So both our consumer facing or enterprise facing forum product for meetings was capturing a lot of attention, um, but so were uh, the Gravity product and the presentations we were giving in those areas, both for automotive and for home. Mm -hmm. And then the home solution also extended into the in-flight arena. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's definitely a huge benefit to CES is that you don't just get to you know show off to the consumer in general and, of course, the media and the press who are going to you know run back with their little acorns of a story and publish them. But yeah, like you said, uh, being able to network and network with uh, really the people you want to network, that, that is, uh, that's hugely everything about CES, or that's what CES is all about. So I'm, ha I'm happy that you had not just a lot of uh, people come to your booth, but of course, the right people come to your booth. Um, talk about um, CES. Was there anything that uh, that surprised you about it? You know, obviously, like you said, uh, there was a lot of interest from a lot of large corporations that would probably use it in different ways you didn't see. Uh, were, were there any surprises with CES that you, uh, you know, that you had? Yeah, there's, I think there was one that was really kind of fun for us, and, and that was uh, Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian was giving a keynote. The moderator at one point asked him, you know, Ed, when I'm on a plane, I want to start a movie with my traveling partner and be able to have a shared experience, watch the same movie at the same time, be able to pause it, uh, maybe for a bio break or something, and, and come back and still have that shared experience. And he paused and said, we've got some pretty bright people here. We, we think we can do something about that. Well, the answer is, is we're already doing that. <laughs> yeah, they, um, people are obviously asking for what it is that you're obviously doing. And hey, that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I can completely see where, like I said, being able to, well, I, I, I mentioned dumping files all at once to people who, you know, just kind of want it, but uh, that's another use case that I'm sure you're going to rather refine. And actually, this might be a good way to kind of segue into almost the end of the interview, but as you see forum advancing, and of course, I'm sure that your team is still working on it. How do you see forum progressing? Is this, uh, it, is it again chasing down these kind of niche uh, uh, use cases with museums and companies and education, which, you know, don't get me wrong, every one of those is a large uh, sector and of course a lot of customers, but where do you see this? Do you see it really, again, corporate office space or is it now about kind of spider webbing out and chasing down every possible use case? I think it really is about the core office environment. And when you consider that something like 40% of employees spend between 15 and 30 minutes a day looking for a place to meet, in other words, a place with a monitor typically, mm -hmm. um, there's a huge cost in human capital to that type of wasted time because they're frustrated. They're not able to use the open spaces that the company has built for them because they need to have a shared visual experience, yet they're wandering around the hallways looking for a place to meet. So there's an efficiency factor, a 
two ways. One's human factor, and the other is is better utilization of the square footage you're already paying for. So I think there's there's absolutely that. But then each day we talk to people, we learn about new scenarios and situations where forum solves a real business challenge for them. Hey, and that is not a bad place to be. And of course, being uh, being the one to facilitate all this and really, like you said, just improving everyone's productivity, there's a lot to be said for that. So, uh, Dan, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I'll let you have the last word. Is there anything that we didn't cover, anything that we didn't touch on that you feel we probably should? Just that Forum is in some ways the tip of the iceberg of what's capable and, and new things coming that are built into that Gravity platform. It is extremely powerful, and um, we've got a lot of people looking at it, which is really rewarding. Yeah, but thanks I, for your time, Ben. It's oh, fun uh, being on uh, the show. Yeah, our, our pleasure. Happy that you could join us. And and by the way, just lo- looking at Gravity, I see here that uh, you know you guys are also looking to get into the automotive space. I will say at CES, I'm sure that you noticed this as well. Uh, CES was all about not just cars, but connected cars, and realizing that as more you know as less emphasis on actually driving the car is going to be put you know that attention has to go elsewhere and hey you know the entertainment the entertainment center of a car is going to be ever so important and i guess hey you know your technology could be at the center of any one of those connected cars so you uh yeah gravity seems like an, another very interesting product but hey not enough time for that uh everyone once again we have been talking to mr dan brooke he is the chief marketing officer for facetto and dan thank you so much for co- joining us on computer america thanks ben appreciate the time our pleasure and hey we're gonna go do computer technology news but uh if you know dan open invitation anything new any, anything interesting come back on happy to talk to you about it Will do. Thanks right. so much. Have a good one. Bye bye. And everyone, there we go. So let's go ahead and continue on with computer and technology news. And hey, that's brought to you by Computer America. So let's go ahead and get this started. Okay, it's here. Here we go. So everyone, I think that our first story that we're going to do is, (laughs) okay, uh, just real quick, and yeah, we should go there. So I think our first story that we're going to do, we have a ton of different stories that we could uh, actually pull from, and you know what? Let's start with, we teased this one at the beginning of the show, let's go ahead and jump into it, coronavirus. It wouldn't be a head-catching show if we couldn't include that in the title of today's program at all. So here we go. This is, uh, let's see, let's go ahead and mute that. They said that uh, coronavirus threatens the iPhone 9 production and entire electronics industry. What that means is if this thing runs rampant through China, really that's what will run, you know, that, that's what will cause production delays. So this is from Tom's Guide, and they're saying that uh, I can't imagine a scenario where the supply chain isn't disrupted. Those are the words of Patrick Moorhead, a veteran electronic analyst, uh, talking about the coronavirus crisis and how it will affect the production of iPhone and other electronics. You know, and he actually, uh, you know, he actually was ahead of today's announcement. I don't know if you heard about this, but uh, I think a couple of hours ago, they said that... uh, China has shut down Foxconn and another production factory that produce these smartphones. And the reason is, is that these facilities employ tens of thousands of people and they're working in very tight, you know, very close quarters with one another. You know, they're shoulder to shoulder in a lot of cases working on production lines. And, you know, obviously the spread of something like the coronavirus, uh, this coronavirus, the reason, and, and, you know, if there's any, uh, anyone more suited to explain this than me, please feel free to drop us a line. But I will say that the reason this is such a big deal is that the coronavirus, this particular strain, which is related to, you know, the flu and other, and of course, SARS and things like that, 
This particular strain has not made that leap from animals to people. You know, we've seen it in animals, but in people, we have no idea what the side effects are. We have no idea how actually deadly it is, how infectious it is. Uh, we have some early indications, but we don't have a strict, you know, this is this is the fatality rate. This is how it's transferred. Uh, we can assume it's done through fluids and not, you know, by the air. Uh, wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Things like that. So... We know the very basics of the coronavirus, but we don't know a lot about the true effects of it. So when it's working its way through China, they would rather not have these giant facilities with tens of thousands of workers all get infected and then suddenly, potentially, you know, a large number of them, well, fall over dead. And, you know, first of all, you don't want people to die. People dying is bad. Computer America taking hardline stances with you. But you also don't want specific workforces taking a massive hit like that. And so because of that, Foxconn in particular has already shut down their production facilities. So with that being said, China <clears throat> Sorry, China is the number one producer of goods on the planet, and it is now in complete panic mode, closing entire cities and limiting communications in what is the biggest quarantine operation in history. And by the way, if you didn't know, yeah, this is uh, not a good look for China, but uh, they're trying their best to, you know, quarantine. They said that uh, the area is not only one of the biggest producers of iron and steel, it's considered a crucial hub in the middle of China, with the Yangtze River going across it, three railway stations, and an airport. It is also considered a major, automo a major au automobile industry, electronics, optics, and fiber optics production site. In fact, 230, get this, 230 of the Fortune 500 companies have investment in the area. That means some kind of production facility. That means uh, you know they're leasing something or they're shipping things through that uh, you know through that port. So they said that the virus, which at the time of this writing has reportedly killed 100 out of 4,500 people infected in the Asian country, will for sure affect all this activity, and the impact will ripple through the entire industrial network and the country all the way to the coastal centers where consumer electronics products are made for Western companies like Apple. Now, the main point of this article, they said that the iPhone SE 2, which is known as the iPhone 9, remember how we skipped from iPhone 8 to iPhone 9, or I'm sorry, the iPhone 10, they're stepping back a little bit, and that will be the, uh, the successor to the iPhone SE uh, 5SE. They said that uh, if one if there's one major hiccup in the raw materials, fabrication, assembly, test, and shipping, it will be a disruption. So, while Foxconn says this, it's declining to give any specifics on how production will be affected and if there's any disruption to production right now. We know since this article was released, Foxconn has indeed shut down their production facilities for the time being until they get a better understanding of what it is this, uh, you know, this... Coronavirus actually will do to their workforce. They said that uh, this will be the first serious test for both Apple's providers. We will see if there's any delay from the rumored release dates in the coming days, or if it finally hits the launch window, we will see what happens for the availability of the iPhone, which is, of course, one of the most popular phones on the planet. So, my big thing here is uh, great, of course, reporting from Tom's Guide. I do just want to say, though, that it probably won't affect it as much as this article is kind of making it out to be. I mean, let's face it, the entire Southeast Asian Pacific region was has, has been hit by giant uh, tsunamis and typhoons and natural disasters happen all the time. Uh, well, you know, of course, 100 people is 100 people too many to die. Uh, 4,500 people infected in one city as opposed to thousands and thousands of people wiped out by, you know, tsunamis resulting from earthquakes uh, happen, you know, has has happened in the recent past. And we've been able to bounce back from that even more. Uh, admittedly, this is not happening in a coastal city, but rather in central China. But still, my point's the same. It's bad. And 
I hope it, you know, I hope it doesn't get worse, but it's not the worst thing to happen. And I fully anticipate them to absorb this. And hopefully China treats this with as much respect as they possibly can. So there you go. So with that being said, let's uh, let's go ahead and continue on our next story that we're going to do. Story number two. Check this one out. The company behind the Eve 5, and I'm going to say the E5 or the Eve V laptop, is back with a crowd-developed monitor. You know, just received uh, an email from a company that's going to be debuting some of its new monitors. Uh, gaming display and monitor displays, hugely popular and really looking forward to it. So, but this one is the Eve Spectrum displays are available for pre-order today. And they said that the Finnish company, so not Finnish like the Finnish line, but the Finnish as in the Finnish people. Finnish company Eve focuses on crowd-developed products, taking input from gamers and power users to shape hardware designs. With the Eve 5, a convertible tablet similar to the Microsoft Surface was a, uh, was a strong effort. It packed more RAM than the similarly priced Surface tablet and had a sharper screen than most competitors. This year, the company hopes to bring three gaming monitors to market. The Spectrum series is meant to deliver high-end performance that gamers, designers, engineers are looking for in a monitor. By gathering and and implementing feedback directly from the EVE community, and while they aren't scheduled to ship until much later this year, well, the three models are now up for pre-order, which will go ahead and throw that up on the screen. And uh, I, I definitely appreciate the feedback that uh, this company is utilizing to develop their products. I will say, though, that for them to kind of say that our our selling point is that we let power users design our hardware... I feel like that sells a lot of other companies short because you can be darn sure a lot of other companies would love to take that feedback in themselves. It's just that actually doing that, um, actually doing that market research and hosting those polls and getting that feedback is such a massive effort. And I'm glad that Eve was able to get this, you know, kind of crowdsourced, um, you know, by themselves. But other companies would love that same information and would love to act on it and sell you products based on the information, but they kind of have to pay for it. You know, Eve is able to get it, I guess, kind of uh, free, but there you go. And by the way, here's what, uh, you know, here's what the monitors look like. Very utilitarian, but at the same time, it's, um, yeah, this is, uh, they're pretty darn cool. They're, they're definitely good looking. So here are some of the specs, one millisecond response time, which is pretty typical for a uh, for a gaming monitor nowadays. NVIDIA G-Sync, AMD FreeSync, both compatible and certified. Uh, it's an IPS oxide panel, and of course, a 240 hertz refresh rate. So smooth as butter, as they can say. Uh, they have all the different uh, ports that are available to it, and a single lightning cable that's able to connect to... Uh, you know, any laptops or things like that. So now with that being said, to uh, continue on here, the most affordable is the Spectrum monitor at $350, 2560 by 1440p with a refresh rate of 165 hertz, which ladies and gentlemen, if you have not upgraded from 60 hertz to 144 hertz, highly recommend it. They said that the mid-tier option, running you almost $500, has the same resolution, but an even faster refresh rate, which I think runs at about uh, 240 hertz, is what that one does. And then the next one is a 4K monitor at 144 hertz, which is really ideal for a main monitor. All three have a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, 27 inch LG HDR display, and of course, a staggering amount of ports. None of the monitors comes with a stand. Eve says that 47% of the community prefer to buy a Spectrum without one. Check that out. No monitor stands. The people have spoken. They don't want that superfluous fluff. And they said that the company will sell a $99 stand separately with, uh, with features such as height adjustment, a quick release switch, and a portrait orientation. Uh, with that being said, going by the specs, 
They said that these could become go-to displays if Eve doesn't run into, into production problems. Uh, they said that uh, after, well, yeah, Eve CEO says that that won't happen again. Barring such hiccups, the company expects to ship the 1440p model in Q3 and the other two in Q4. So pretty darn cool. Pretty darn cool. So this next one, we, uh, we have time. So Dyson. They're one of my favorite companies. When it comes to design, they are up there with, like, Apple. They really take design to another level. And so Dyson decides that their newest light, the Light Cycle Morph, so two words, Light Cycle Morph, is the most flexible lamp yet. Who knew? They said that um, at first glance, it looks similar to the Dyson Light Cycle introduced last year, and it has many of the same key features, like the ability to automatically adjust based on your local daylight. It also has three axes, which allow it to rotate into a different position. Uh, but, of course, hey, check it out. You'll have to shell out a minimum of $650 for this updated version. You know, I love Dyson. I love their design. They... They do things that no one else does, uh, but they are expensive. I'm, I'm not doubting that whatsoever. They are expensive. So they're saying for indirect light, the head rotates to bounce light off walls, floors, and ceilings. You can aim the light cycle morph at art for feature lighting or use it as a more traditional workspace. The morph will also add light, uh, also adds a light up stem that emits a warm orange glow and can emulate candlelight. I'm noticing that red light is becoming more and more popular for uh, for people because so much of our life is dedicated to blue light. You know, something that something that monitors naturally give off, but it's just so bad for you. And by the way, if you're watching the video portion, you can kind of see what the morph looks like. Uh, yeah, it's it's the stand that you know kind of moves all around. So there you go. Uh, yeah. It's certainly different. They said that uh, the Morph is available right now in a desk model. So there's two. There's a desk and a floor model. 650 and 850 a piece. Man, that is pricey. They said that that's definitely a lot to spend on a lamp. But according to the company, it should last upwards of about 60 years. Six zero. Eh, thanks to a special copper rod cooling system that expands or that promises to extend its lifespan. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to have to extend my lifespan if I'm going to get the full 60 years out of that. What the heck? Like the original Dyson light cycle, the morph adjusts based on your age. According to Dyson, a 65 year old needs four times more light than a 20 year old. You can opt for the preset mode, study, relax, and others. And hey, all you have to do is give it a blood sample. I'm kidding, not a blood sample, but really, 600 or 850 bucks for a single light that could last you in the neighborhood of 60 years. You know, I'm going to bookmark this. I'm going to bookmark this and I'm going to get them on the show. That sounds super interesting. So we have time for just one more story and so many to choose from. Why don't we go ahead and talk about, you know, this is going to affect a lot of people out there. So anyone out there with a Samsung Galaxy S9 or greater, yes, talking to Android phones, they should be receiving an update for Android 10, saying that it's the third major version of Android available for the 2018 flagship. And almost two full, two full years after they were released in March 2018, the Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus are starting to get updates uh, I'm sorry, starting to get updated to Android 10, with the update already rolling out to users in Germany and Xfinity mobile customers in the U.S. The S9 lineup originally launched with an Android Oreo, making this the third major Android version for the phone for the two phones. Uh, of course, before that, you had Android Pie. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. It was Oreo, then Pie, and now we are running into Android 10, which I'm sure has some ridiculous name to it as well. Let's see if we can find out what the name of Android 10 is. Android 10 is called... Boy, it doesn't even say. It just says Android 10. It might just be called Android 10. They might have dropped the uh, the food altogether. 
Who knew? But still, uh, and actually, you know what? We're going to go ahead and throw this up here to see what it is that you can do, including dark mode. They said that uh, thanks to the complexity of Android updates across multiple carriers in the U.S., it could be days or weeks before it hits your device. So with that being said, Samsung has already rolled out Android 10 for Galaxy S10, S10 Plus, S10e, Note 10, Note 10 Plus, as well as Galaxy Note 9s. So there you go. The Galaxy Fold does not have it yet either, but don't worry. Not many people actually bought that, so it's okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, if you have a Galaxy phone and or at least a Galaxy S9, it looks like they're trying to get everyone onto Android 10. And if you want to see what features actually come with Android 10, you can check it out android.com forward slash Android hyphen 10, or we'll have a link over at Computer America. Ladies and gentlemen, the music playing softly in the background means we're out of time. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in to Computer America. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed the show. Uh, tune in tomorrow as we have the one, the only, Mr. Scott Schober, as we are going to be discussing everything about cybersecurity. There's been a lot of updates. It's been a little while since we talked to him. Considering the holidays, it's been like a month and a half or two months. We're going to catch up, see how he is, and, hey, get to the heart of cybersecurity and what is going on. So until next time, have a great day. Thank you for tuning in. Once again, find us on social media, wherever social media you're using. There is probably an at Computer America right there waiting for you. Uh, If you missed the show or any part of it, check out the podcast, wherever podcasts are heard. And in the meantime, everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye.